Conspiracy this, conspiracy that. This is the fifth time I've made this video, so hopefully you know what's going on. In honor of this landmark 5.0 video, I've done what every successful YouTuber has done at one point or another. Outsource my work to you. In my last conspiracy theory video, I asked you all to give me your best Big Brother theories, and there were so many good ones that I'm dedicating this iteration of the series to all of you lovely commenters. The five theories that we'll be going over were all taken from 4.0's comment section, and there are some absolute bangers. Did Cameron steal a house guest choice veto chip? Did Shima not actually throw her microphone into the hot tub? Today, we'll be going through those and more as we continue on this never-ending journey of theories. Consider subscribing if you aren't already, and without further ado, here are five of your Big Brother conspiracy theories. I don't really have that high of hopes because I don't think he's exactly the best problem solver in the house. Sorry, Corey. Since I already teased it, we might as well start with it. The first conspiracy theory of the day is that after choosing the house guest choice veto chip in week three, Cameron pocketed it and used it in future veto meetings. The house guest choice veto chip is almost always going to be the most desirable chip to choose because you can pick whichever player you want to compete. So there is a plausible motive here, but before we dive too deep into the theory, we gotta do some math and see how crazy the odds actually are. For this math, I assume that there were two house guest choice veto chips because that's the most that we've ever seen drawn at one veto meeting, and that's also the number I used in the last episode about Ceri's veto odds. So for consistency's sake, we'll assume that there's only two in the box for Cameron as well. After choosing the house guest choice veto chip in week three, this is how Cameron's future polls looked. He pulled house guest choice in week four, he pulled house guest choice in week five, he pulled Matt in week six, and then he pulled house guest choice one final time in week nine. That's three out of four times, which is pretty freaking unlikely. After doing the calculations, the probability that Cameron picked house guest choice three out of four times following week three is roughly 2.3%. Those are actually right around the odds of Ceri's chip never being chosen, meaning that this isn't impossible. Improbable, yes, but not impossible. Plus, you would think that production would notice if they were missing a house guest choice chip, and I of course had to look at what Cameron was wearing when he drew the veto chips to make sure that he wasn't wearing long sleeves, and for the most part, his sleeves were rolled up enough to make me feel pretty confident that he couldn't slip it in there when his hand was in the box. So as fun as it is to say that Cameron stole a house House guest choice veto chip and used it in future veto draws, I have to assume that Cameron just had very good luck, so I'm gonna say that this conspiracy theory isn't super likely. Jostle these chips about. House guest choice. House guest choice. Two in a row. Two in a row. And house guest choice. Wow. House guest choice. Up next, we have one that I actually find extremely interesting, and I'm surprised I haven't heard of it before, and that's the theory that in Big Brother 19, Christmas was only allowed to play in the final seven sprinting HOH because they knew that Paul had organized everyone to throw the competition, and they wanted their big TV moment of the girl with the broken foot to win a foot race. For those that don't remember, Christmas had broken her foot in like the first week of Big Brother 19, and it was so serious that she actually had to be removed from the house to get surgery on it. This left Christmas in a boot and she needed to use a scooter or crutches for pretty much the rest of the season. Because of this, Christmas was not medically cleared to compete in certain comps that were too physical, like Otev for example. So, along those lines, you might think that Christmas, who had a broken foot, would not be medically cleared to compete in an HOH that was almost entirely dependent on a foot race. If Christmas was forced to sprint during this competition, she could have injured herself even further. And even though I'm not going to sit here and pretend like I know what I'm talking about when it comes to who would be liable for that type of injury, I feel like it would make sense that she would not be allowed to compete in this comp just as she had for some past ones. But I'd be wrong because she was allowed to compete. Behind the scenes, Paul had set up this really intricate plan to get almost everyone to throw the competition to Christmas or Josh, so it really does seem like production allowed Christmas to compete knowing that this was the plan. The competition played out and it ended up working out where every single person fouled out before any sprinting actually took place, meaning that Christmas won the competition by default. 
I can totally see why production would want their TV moment of having the girl with the broken foot win the sprinting competition, especially after learning about Paul's plan to have everyone throw it, and I can't really think of any other reason that they would allow Christmas to compete in it. So for that, I'm gonna have to back this conspiracy theory and give it my stamp of approval. Christmas, unfortunately, a doctor has not medically cleared you to compete in this competition. You must sit out. That's pig poop. <laughs> a track and field competition? Seriously? I have a broken foot, but my little competitive spirit isn't gonna quit. I'm going to give it all of my one good leg. Over the past week, I've crafted a master plan to have everybody throw this competition to Joshua Christmas. The whole plan pretty much hinges on Kevin to be the first one to throw it. Christmas is the new head of households! <laughs> I'm HOH. I literally can't believe that I pulled that off. I pretty much got the one-legged girl to win a foot race. I don't even have to make a joke. Up next, we have another competition theory, and although I can't find the specific comment, I swear someone brought it up under the 4.0 video, and that's the theory that the producers actually helped Corey win the Final Six Veto Comp in Big Brother 18 for some reason. The Veto Comp was a MacGyver-themed escape room course that the players would go through one at a time, and whoever had the fastest time would win. The first room of the course saw a manhole on the floor that was locked in by a piece of wood, and the players had to figure out that the pipes on the wall were actually detachable in the key to getting past that first room. You can see all of the players look at the manhole and then slowly figure out that they need to look for some sort of key. Well, except for one player, Corey. Corey walks through the door and without even looking at the manhole, he goes straight for the correct pull. Maybe Corey is just extremely observant and figured it out in one second, but it seems very fishy that he walked in and immediately knew to grab the pole before figuring out what the puzzle even was. All the players had to wear earpieces that gave them small instructions on where to go, so it is entirely possible that Corey was fed information through this earpiece in order to give him an advantage. As to why production would want Corey to win, it's possible that they were rooting for Nicole and Corey over James and Natalie who were on the block at this point, so by Corey winning the veto, it would ensure that he and Nicole were both safe. Corey did end up winning the veto, and the person that he beat was Natalie, which adds a little bit of credence to this theory. And although I do think that my justification as to why production might do this is probably wrong, it is just so puzzling how Corey knew exactly where to go in the first room that I have to assume that something was going on here. Escape through the secret tunnel. So I'm in the first room and I'm looking over at the manhole cover and I see there's two bolts with two different shapes. And I know that I need to find these shapes to open it up. I'm so confused. Escape through the secret tunnel. Escape through a secret tunnel, okay. Escape through the secret tunnel. I get through the manhole. I feel like I got through that first room pretty quick. Honestly, I'm kind of like MacGyver, or he's kind of like me. Up next, we have another Big Brother 25 conspiracy theory, although this is a bit of a strange one, so please bear with me. This is the theory that Big Brother 25 intentionally had a seven-person jury, a power of invincibility, and the week-long zombie battle back solely because they only wanted to have to rent the jury house for one month. For a little bit of explanation, in Modern Big Brother, the jury stage of the game usually begins around the start of week six, meaning that the jury house would start being occupied after the week six eviction, which is usually around day 44. However, Big Brother 25 had what felt like a never-ending pre-jury. As the week four eviction ended up being canceled due to Matt using the power of invincibility to save Jag, then week eight was a week-long dedicated battle back where nobody was evicted, and also the size of the jury went from nine to seven, which added on an additional two weeks to the pre-jury. So when you add in all of these additional weeks, that meant that instead of needing the jury house by day 44, it was needed on day 73. That is practically an entire month later than normal, and since Big Brother 25 is a 100-day season, that means that the jury house would only be needed for around 26 days. So CBS could feasibly save some money by only renting it out for a month. 
Now, at first glance, I was tempted to believe this, but then I thought about it more and realized how crazy it sounds for Big Brother to go through all of this trouble just to save a few thousand dollars in rent. It was likely just a series of coincidences, combined with the fact that Big Brother thought it would be cool to bring back a seven-person jury that led to the jury house only needing to be around for less than a month. So I'm gonna say that this one is likely not true, but it was still fun to think about. The BB power of invincibility has been activated. That means the house guest you just voted out is now invincible and cannot be evicted. This week, there will be no head of household, no nomination ceremony, no veto competition, and no veto meeting. Cameron and Jared, next Thursday, one will win their way back into the game while the other's game will be dead and buried forever. Usually, this is where I would also congratulate everyone left in the game for making it to at least the jury of nine. However, we're going old school. We used to have a jury of seven, and that is exactly what we are doing this season. And lastly, we have one that actually has some pretty big ramifications on what I thought to be true during a historical Big Brother event, but at the same time, I guess it really doesn't change that much. And that's the theory that in Big Brother 11, Shima didn't actually throw her microphone into the hot tub. Rather, she just threw it across the yard. However, it ended up bouncing into the hot tub anyways. For those that don't know, house guest Shima Simone was fed up with the producers after a twist was implemented into the game that sent her out ally Jessie home on her HOH, so in retaliation, she stopped listening to the rules. This ultimately culminated with Shima throwing her microphone directly into the hot tub, which destroyed the expensive equipment and led to Shima's immediate expulsion. The episode portrayed that Shima intended to throw the mic directly into the hot tub, however, it seems like that might not actually be the case. Shima was standing pretty far away from the hot tub when she threw the microphone, so it's not super likely that her nonchalant underhand toss would land perfectly on target in the center of the hot tub. Going past that, on the Big Brother 22 live feeds, Kevin even briefly mentioned that the microphone actually bounced into the hot tub as opposed to landing right in it. Also, without getting too technical and into the physics of it all, the angle in which Shima throws the microphone does not match up with the angle that the microphone enters the hot tub. Shima throws it with a pretty strong vertical arc, but it enters the hot tub with a more horizontal arc, which doesn't add up if it was one continuous motion. Also, the clip itself is cut up and we never actually see the microphone go from Shima's hand into the hot tub as one continuous shot. What does this mean at the end of the day? Well, it might mean that Shima wasn't intentionally trying to destroy the equipment, which is something, but she was still blatantly disregarding the rules and pushing the line for what was going to be allowed by the producers. So although I do genuinely believe the theory that Shima didn't throw her mic directly into the hot tub, not much actually changes because of it. Did you hear mic? Thanks, because she wouldn't get it. You're welcome. Uh, she oh Shima! God. Shima! Shima grabs her mic, turns around, and just chucks it. No! I was mortified. It fell out of her hand. Yeah, it fell. And there we go. I'm kind of locked into this series now, and I'm aiming to make at least 10 of these. So if you have a good theory and you want to be featured in a future episode, please comment it down below and I'll take a look. Anyways, thank you so much for watching. If you're new here, consider subscribing. I, of course, need to give that extra special shout out to all of my YouTube members and patrons who actually would have figured out the MacGyver puzzle faster than Corey. And as always, here's a clip for you on your way out. I do feel betrayed because Matt said I will never put you up. He's no different than everybody else. And take two of these, one for you and one for Jag. Matter of fact, there's an extra for Bowie J. <laughs>